Well, hey guys, how you guys doing? You guys doing good? Um, man, well, my name's Chuck. Uh, I think maybe uh, you guys have heard me a couple different times up on Sunday morning. Um, so a lot of your, uh, our whole table back here, I think most of you guys have college kids uh, in our college ministry. And uh, man, I, if you were here a few weeks ago on Sunday morning, uh, you know that I had a lot to say about being single because I was single uh, for a really long time. And uh, I don't know, like, why are they asking me to talk about marriage? I've only been married for two years, two and a half years. And, uh, but, uh, so I, I don't feel, I feel like actually I'm going to learn a lot from, from other folks in this room. Uh, you've been married, a lot of you have been married uh, for so much longer than that. Um, when I, in 2015, uh, I got handed a, a small congregation, a congregation of about 150 people. And it was in a college town, was a city of about 50,000 people with about 25,000 college students. So it kind of made sense. This like guy that was, you know, taught at colleges and worked with college students would pastor this smaller church in a college town and reach college students. And so I got to this uh, little church, um, and there actually weren't that many college students in the little church. Uh, there were a lot of uh, families, and, and pretty quickly, um, I was being asked to perform weddings, um, and I wasn't married. I think I'm the only, I'm maybe one of the only people I know, one of the only pastors I know, uh, that had to uh, pastor for a significant season of time not being married and, and had to do a lot of weddings as a guy who wasn't married, okay? So I don't, it, doing weddings are kind of intimidating anyway. You kind of hold the microphone uh, the whole time and, you know, you make sure they get to the end of it and kiss and you pronounce them. And so as a single guy, I started having to do weddings all the time, and so so that was a little bit intimidating. And then on top of that, um, because I was at this church of 150 people, and I was the only full-time uh, staff, uh, when marriages started to kind of fall apart, um, I was the pastor people grabbed onto. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, I don't know if you've ever, I'm, I'm not a good swimmer. I mean, is anybody not a good swimmer? Uh, I tell you, uh, but I can swim to save my life, barely. <laughs> I tell you what I cannot do is I cannot swim if you grab onto my leg. <laughs> like, I do not have any buoyancy at all. And so if I'm swimming and somebody like grabs onto me just to play with me, I will go down and I'll go down quick. And that's kind of like what it was when people would come to me and be like, okay, you know, our marriage is like falling apart. We've had a catastrophe where we haven't, we haven't had a civil conversation in the last two years. You know, you're our pastor, we need help. And immediately I'd feel like I was just starting to sink. Uh, just, I'm like, I'm barely breathing up here anyway as a pastor, and now you want me to help you with something that I have no idea, you know, what are you talking about? And people would invite me into conversations, and I would just be like, oh, man, I have just, oh, don't talk to me. I'm single. <laughs> don't tell me that sex is hard, and it's been difficult, and... And I would just I would have these like moments of just being like, oh, man. Um, but, but it just kept happening a lot. And so I just kind of had to go, okay, God, what are you, you know, what's my, what's my role here? What are you calling me to do? And how can I serve uh, marriages? And so I, I, I went to the thing that I did fairly know, uh, which was the Bible. And, uh, and I, I realized actually that the Bible was loaded with this story of marriage. And in fact, my favorite thing to say at a wedding would be that the Bible opens with a marriage. You guys know that, right? The Bible opens with a, a grand marriage, um, and it's beautiful, and it's amazing. Um, and then, you know, a few thousand years later, Jesus shows up on a broken planet, and the first thing he does is he rescues a wedding. That's the first thing he does. He shows up and he rescues a wedding. And I used to always, always ask congregations, you know, uh, first of all, a lot of people in my context come from a Baptist background, and they didn't know that the way he rescued a wedding was he made more wine for the party. <laughs> I used to love that joke, you know. I'd be like, and you know how he rescued the wedding? Man, he, he got the best stuff, and he brought it. That didn't always go so well in the Bible Belt, but I still liked it. Um, 
And, uh, but Jesus showed up and he rescued a wedding. And of course, the serious answer to the question of why did he do that is that the story of God is rooted in a wedding. And Jesus loves weddings and he loves marriages. And uh, Tim Keller was famous for saying that Jesus was making a statement about weddings and about marriage, which is that he wants the party to continue. He wants the story to go on. He wants the party to keep moving forward. And there's going to come a day, I would love to tell people, and you fast forward to the last page of the Bible and you open up the last page of the Bible and there is a grand wedding that's going to last for eternity. A wine that will never run out, praise God. And, and a party and food and fellowship and relationships and the world just the way God always intended it to be, the new heavens and the new earth. And it's all rooted in the story of a marriage. And, and that actually gave me something in my soul that I was like, hey, I, I actually, you know, it's funny, the first time I got asked to do a wedding, I was like, I don't want to do a wedding. I'm single. I don't want to get married. You know, I don't really want to do that. And the more I embedded myself in that story the more I love doing weddings, and the more excited I got, not maybe one day of getting married, that was something I was excited about, but I got more and more excited about what marriage was actually all about, which is that it aimed me toward the day. I, used to, I would look at people standing in front of me getting married, and I said, you know what I love about this? Is this white dress, and this guy sharp in his suit or his tux, this picture tells me that one day everything's going to be right. This picture tells me that one day every tear is wiped away. This picture right here tells me that there's coming a moment where God is working in the world. And we stand up here and we celebrate this moment. Yeah, this is a great thing that's happening. But this is an echo of eternity that there is a God on the move. And the way he's told all of us that things will not be left as they are and they will be right forever is this wedding in this marriage. And I think that's actually why marriages are so important, and I think that's why there's so much attack on our marriages. Satan would love to try to obliterate the, the most physical thing we can look at and say, that's God at work in the world. God is at work in the world. How do we know? Because this marriage thing of a guy, Ephesians says, who lays down his life and a woman who says, man, I'm going to respect and submit to his authority. Those things are echoes that God is working in a broken world to make everything right in the world. And so the enemy would love to just attack it. And he is attacking it because he would love to mess up the most beautiful picture we have that one day God is going to make it right. And we're going to be with him forever. So we're talking about forgiveness. I don't know where are we going with this. We're talking about forgiveness uh, this afternoon. Um, and I think forgiveness is a powerful thing. But here's, I think, the big idea is all of it in, in our marriage, and forgiveness by implication, it's all rooted in the gospel story. Everything about our marriage is embedded in the gospel story. And so you may ask yourself, and, and, and people, I ask people all this all the time, especially with college students, I say, as I tell them, tell me the gospel. You want to see a college kid sweat, especially when he's been in church his whole life. And you're like, hey, tell me the gospel. And they're like, ah, uh, Jesus loves me. You know, I, I don't know. The gospel actually for many of us, even those of us who have been in the church for a while, is often what we believe to get saved. We've often got a view of the gospel that says, that's what I believe to get saved. Like, I, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I confessed that I was a sinner. I said, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe in the cross for my forgiveness of my sins. And now I'm saved. I was lost, and now I'm found. And it's the gospel. It's the cross of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And I prayed the sinner's prayer. And that's the gospel, and I'm saved. And you may be shocked, or maybe not, but you may be shocked to know that the gospel is actually Actually, that's true. That's true. The gospel is how you got saved. But the gospel is also this big, massive narrative that covers the Bible from the front page to the last page. And so I think as we're going to talk about forgiveness for a second, we have to lay a context for forgiveness. And the context for forgiveness is the plot points of the gospel. So you can see this for a second. There's, there's five uh, plot points to the gospel. Um, you're going to see how this relates to forgiveness in a second. The first is creation. So God showed up, the gospel, just, and this is a powerful thing, I think, to get in our heads, especially as we share the gospel with other people. The gospel does not start with you're a sinner. Did you know that? It doesn't start there. 
The starting place of the narrative of God is not, you're a sinner, and I better fix it. The gospel starts with a creator who showed up and he created an amazing universe, and then he said, I want to self-communicate my beauty in the universe. And the best way to self-communicate my beauty in the universe is to create image bearers of my beauty. And so he created man and woman in his image. He put them in the planet, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. And that's just a very straightforward way to say, make my beauty known everywhere on the planet. So that wherever you go, whatever you do, this is why Christian parents should be all about cranking out kids, is because at the heartbeat, we are, we are chunking out image bearers into the world so when people go, that's the beauty of God. That's the amazing glory and beauty of God. That's what the whole fruitful and multiply thing is all about. It starts in creation. It's also the foundation for why the person you're looking at who has wounded you is somebody made in the image of God that you now have, should have some bandwidth to look at and say, hey, where do we go from from here? This is why nobody do, nobody's trash. And people used to talk like that. I hear people all that. Man, this person's trash. I hear, I hear podcasts like that where people talk like that. Right? This person's total trash. This person's worthless. This idea is worthless. This person is a terrible person, a terrible human being. It's very common to talk like that, especially about people who've wounded us and hurt us. And we may not say that about our spouse, but, I, but I, I think sometimes we have this thing in us where we, our starting place with people isn't that they're made in God's image. So if they're made in God's image, that's going to give us the context for why we even move closer to them even though they've wounded us. It gives us the context to say, why are you worth the time to deal with this mess that's in front of us? It's because the person in front of you is an image bearer, made in the beautiful image of God, and they are, even in the next plot point of the gospel, in their brokenness, in their rebellion, in their most broken state, even there, they are an image, a reflection of the image of God. And that's why you draw close even when there's mess. But the second plot point of the gospel is the brokenness. The sin entered the world. And the reason I like to use brokenness instead of the fall, the fall would be like the more theological term to use. The reason we say brokenness is because sometimes we don't understand that brokenness isn't just my willful decisions to sin, but it's the way my body is broken. If you are dealing with a physical thing, that's part of the fall. Uh, if you're having, you know, the best way the Bible talked about it was when the guy goes out and plants a garden, there's going to be thistles. The whole universe is broken. So yeah, your willful rebellion of God is broken rebellion against God, but so are some of the disordered emotions you have. So are some of the broken chemistry going on in your mind. Some of it is the fact that your body hurts. I know people whose marriages have been really under a lot of strain because somebody in the marriage has a physical disability that's never Never gonna go away. And that's part of the fall. That's part, it's right in the mix of everything. And I know people, you go, well, that doesn't really make sense. They haven't really wounded the other person. I know people that in their marriage are really having to deal with how sin through a physical broken body is wrecking their marriage. You've got to have a broader view of how sin has come in and affected everything. And nothing, not a thing you do, not a thought you have, not a thing going on in the universe you work in is not affected by the fall. It's broken and it's broken pervasively. We've got to know that if we're going to, again, understand how to move towards somebody in the gospel. And then you have redemption. Jesus worked in redemption. He worked in this creation of the image bearers. There's the fall that affected the universe. But then Jesus, God, moved in that from the first pages of the Bible through gathering a people called Israel to bring a Jewish Messiah who would walk the planet, who would be perfect and holy and right, and he would go to the cross, and his blood would be our righteousness. Those who were sinful are now righteous because Jesus has extended his perfect blood for us. That's, that's what we usually go, that's the gospel. And it is the gospel. It's, it is the blazing center of the gospel. 
And it's wrapped up in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And I think Ephesians 2 was quoted earlier, where Jesus, who went to the one who was far off and the one who was new, and he is, through his blood on the cross, he obliterated the hostility between us and God, and he also made peace with us and one another. That's the redemption aspect of the gospel. But then people often stop there because we're very personal in America. We're very individualistic in America. Now, what I love about this group and what I love about this church is there's a lot of people in here that are like, I don't know what you're talking about because I grew up in a collectivistic culture. And we have people in the room who have that experience. And so this is going to be a more, maybe a beautiful idea. For those of us who are more individualistic, the idea that God didn't save you to walk the planet by yourself. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people that I would meet with, and I talk to them about grace and forgiveness in the context of their relationship, and they would be like, why do I need to do that? I've got Jesus, I got my Bible, I'm fine. You know, I've been hurt my whole life, I've done it my own way, why do I need this relationship? What in the world, what's the business in this? This is too much work, and here's the deal, I don't need it, I'm good with Jesus. They do them, I do me, who needs them? That's actually not the gospel. You'll never read the impact of the cross separated from the way it makes one new family, one new household. You'll see it again and again and again. That the, the, the whole, in fact, that's why this whole thing exists. Because we believe the only way to move closer in the gospel toward Jesus is in the context of community is that we create this family. And then, of course, I just as I mentioned earlier, all of this culminates in a marriage in the future. It's all about, ultimately, everything being made right in relationship with Jesus, Revelations 21. That's the plot points of the gospel. So forgiveness, then, is embedded in that. Forgiveness is rooted in that. And the heartbeat of it, as we said a second ago, the heartbeat of this gospel is the grace of Jesus. Look at what Hebrews 4 says. Look at what Hebrews 4 says. Hebrews 4, 14 says this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. That's the blazing center of the gospel story. The blazing center of the gospel story is a God who had made image bearers. Image bearers, they had rebelled. And a God who said, man, I'm going to move in their direction. I'm going to take on human flesh. I'm going to come in weakness. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to walk a broken planet. I'm going to let broken people touch me, hold me, beat me. And I'm going to lay down my life for them. And the implication of that is that you and I can boldly draw near to the throne of grace. We can, we can boldly say, hey, that's the grace of God that says, I made you and I bought you. Come on. I made you. That'd be enough. That'd be enough for God to say, hey, I made you, man, and I made you pretty awesome. You rebelled. Let's wipe the planet with you, and I'll get some other image bearers. And he made you. Then he walked the perfect life we couldn't do. Died on the cross. Spilled his blood. And offered grace from his throne to those who draw near. That's the heartbeat of the gospel. And so then what that says to us then is that if we're saved in this way, if we're people who have come alive in Jesus in this way, then we're people who are called to cultivate a culture of grace. We're people who are called to cultivate and to build a culture of grace. Look at what Colossians says. Paul says this in Colossians 3 Verses 12. It says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if anyone, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. What is that? That's the context of a grace-centered community. 
That I feel like that verse came right after a time where Paul looks at a group of people who wouldn't normally be friends, the rich and the poor, and the white and the black, and the Jew and the Gentile, and the Scythian and the slave. And he says to this group of people that in their time and in our time would have no business doing life together. And he says, oh, you're all one in Christ. And how is this community going to work that's so different from one another? This community is going to put on the gospel of grace. It's going to put on compassion in its hearts and bearing with one another and being patient and humble. It's going to walk and cultivate a culture of grace. And so what's actually interesting about this chapter is you only have to go about six more verses down and it starts talking about husbands and wives. And the marriages that we have are rooted in the community God is creating around Jesus. I used to hear it say all the time that marriages were the foundation of the church. And I think that's far from the truth. The church is the foundation of your marriage. It's the community Jesus is creating around himself through the cross. As we're a part of that, that begins to cultivate marriages out of it. I don't think we work on our marriage and then reverse engineer the church out of our marriage. In fact, I, I, I could almost, I've only been married for a couple of years, I bet the older people in the room can tell me that you cannot cultivate a healthy marriage outside of community. But in community, marriages can flourish. And that's, I think, why you start with the family of God, and then when you talk about the family of God, the same thing happens in Ephesians. You get the family of God, this new community cultivated by the cross, this amazing group of people who now had hostility, but now have peace in one household. And then you go over here to moms and dads and you say, from this community, husbands lay down your life. Wives submit to your husbands. So you have the community and it's a culture that we're called to communicate. And so we, could, we, could, we cultivate it in the church and we could cultivate it uh, in our marriage. So the big question is, and I'm going to get off the stage in a second and let you go to your groups. The big question is, how do we cultivate this culture? How do we cultivate a culture of grace? How do we build a culture of grace in our marriage? Well, if you just look at the two texts that I showed you, the two simple texts, the first one in Hebrews, that you've got Jesus who sympathizes with us in our weakness, is someone that we can now run to at his throne of grace. So the, the, the first thing we could look at then is we could say, we, those who run to the throne of grace have buckets of grace for other people. If you want to be someone who's good, who's able to artfully offer forgiveness to the one who's wounded you, you've got to be someone who runs to the throne of grace. In fact, I'll say it like this. If you don't have a lifestyle of desperately needing God's grace and running to him for all the areas of brokenness you know you need him in, you don't have, you're not going to have any grace to offer anybody else. And, and part of what's required for this is your high self-awareness of your own need for grace. If you're the kind of person who goes, man, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I'm doing pretty good with Jesus. I'm doing all right. I'm kind of cruising. I'm doing all right. I read my Bible every day. And I don't know what your problem is. You need to get your stuff together. I was counseling with somebody, you know, and uh, they were like, they're just sitting there. One person was like this. And I said, okay, well, tell me what's going on. And the girl goes, well, he just needs to get his crap together. And I said, well, what, like, tell me what's happening in the relationship. She goes, uh, him. <laughs> He's the problem. And I said, well, tell me what's been going on here. And she said, I, it's all him. I said, so do you need Jesus in any way? Is there any area where, like, you need Jesus to work in you? Is there any area in your life? If you don't have a sense of your deep need for God's grace, and you're the kind of person who wakes every, every day up going, not going, who's wounded me? But man, God, a holy, awesome God has offered his grace, and I'm more broken than I thought, than I was yesterday. I got more thoughts going on I need dealt with. I've got more weakness in my heart. I've got more selfishness. I've got more pride. And that's rebellion against a holy God. But he's died for me. So now I need him. If you wake up like that, I promise when you're wounded and offended, you've got some grace to offer. When you, I actually think one of the biggest problems for most of us in, in the whole relationship thing is a really low EQ on our own heart. Our own emotional awareness of what's going on in our own heart is what keeps us. So when someone shows up and they've done something to really wound us, I'm not trying to marginalize that at all. 
But our bandwidth to deal with that can be really short if we don't have a high EQ on what's going on in our own heart. And particularly our own sense of vulnerability and brokenness and our own need of grace. We've got to be people who run to the throne of grace. Number two, you see it up there on the screen. You saw this in Colossians just a second ago. It says, put on as what? God's chosen ones. So an identity rooted as someone chosen by God, someone who has their identity rooted in Christ, can offer forgiveness from a secure confidence. And what do I mean by that? I don't know if anyone's had this experience. I know I have. But when someone's kind of offended you or wounded you, hurt you, mistreated you, um, it can feel weak to say, I forgive you. You guys know what I'm talking about? You can kind of feel like, I don't know if this is the right word, like a putz. Like, I'm the one, I, well, so, okay, I said sorry. And they're like, well, you needed to because if you didn't say sorry, then this wasn't going to work out. Or if you, if you didn't forgive me, you know, then like you were going to be without a partner now. And, and so sometimes from our insecurity of like losing somebody or whatever, we, we, we kind of, we don't really know how to forgive because we're, we've got this insecurity driving how we relate to the person in front of us. When you know who you are, and you know you're standing as a person chosen by God. And I think this is true, this, this sense of like security that we need, you know, we need it as we relate to people at work and we need it as we relate to friends. And, but I, I don't think there's any place we need it more than in our most intimate relationship. I, I think that's one of the places that the other person actually will feed off our sense of security in Christ or our insecurity. Our insecurity about whether or not this is working and belong and whether things are working the way we want or whether we know who we are as we're moving through and navigating the relationship. And, and, and Paul says, hey, listen, this culture of grace, it starts by saying, you're chosen and you better get it straight in your mind. You belong to God. Your identity, your worth, it's set in stone. You were made by him, bought by him. You belong to him. And it's from that place that everything that Paul wants to see happen flows out of that identity. The third thing here, and you saw it again in Colossians, that Paul wants them, this putting on, he wants them to grow in godly compassion and kindness toward the brokenness of others. He wants them to grow in, in kindness and compassion. Another word we might use that's really popular today is empathy. To be people of empathy. And I don't know if anybody is a Brene Brown fan or listens to any of the Brene Brown stuff. Um, I don't listen to it too much. But, but there's, there's one really cool thing that she has about empathy, which is that if you want to be empathetic towards someone else's brokenness, you don't have to have the same thing. In fact, I learned this as a pastor. Someone would be going through a massive thing in, in their marriage, and an incredibly painful thing. I didn't have to go through the same thing to, be, to empathize. I just had to recognize I had some of my own pain and I could actually go, man, my need for God in that space allows me to lean into your need for God in your space. You don't have to have the same problem to be empathetic, but you do have to recognize your need and see that clearly. And so when you have this compassion and this kindness, you're, you're cultivating this empathy toward the person in front of you. So you might ask, and I think sometimes this is really hard, especially when someone's wounded you, right? When someone wounds you, the, the hardest thing to do is to be like, why, what's broken in them that caused them to do that? When someone lashes out at you, the last thing we want to do is be like, well, she probably said that to me because she's hungry. That's why my wife, that's pretty much the only problem she has is when she's hungry, she gets mad at me. I'm like, you have access to the fridge as well. You know, you, you can do that, you know, just, and you know, you can eat. And then she, you know, and then she's eating and I'm like eating again. And she's like, uh, that's been our, mostly our point of conflict during the pregnancy is I'm blown away by how much she needs to eat and how often she needs to eat. I'm just kidding, I'll stop talking. She's gonna get mad at me. <laughs> Ask yourself, what nerve did you just step on? What wound did you just touch? What brokenness did you just trigger? And I actually don't think we're very good at doing that because when you get punched, I don't know about you, but I don't like getting punched. And, uh, and I grew up with a lot of brothers and sisters. So if I get punched, I'm, and I grew up with mostly boys. So, you know, I get punched, I'm going to punch back. 
you know? And it just doesn't go so well in intimate relationships, <laughs> you know? And, and, and there's a sense in which your ability to have empathy and kindness toward the unique way your partner is broken is what will allow you to say, hey, I forgive you. And understanding, the same kind of understanding that we talked about in Hebrews. The kind of thing where Jesus says, hey, grace is offered to you. How can Jesus say grace is offered to you? Well, Hebrews says it's because he understands your weakness. That's mind-blowing. Jesus says, run to grace because I know your weakness. I know where this is coming from. I know the wound that's driving you. So because I know that, because I can sympathize, he can sympathize with all of our brokenness and never have sinned. And because he can do that, he says, come on to the throne of grace. The forgiveness that we offer has to come from a place of saying, man, this co compassion I have for you is an awareness that this isn't out of a vacuum. This isn't just because you're an evil, mean person, and you're just trying to cramp down on my fun, and you don't think I'm cool, and you don't like me, and you just want me to be miserable, don't you? That's not where most sin is coming from. Most sin is coming from other kinds of sin and other kinds of brokenness that have left wounds in our heart. So Paul says, grow in compassion and kindness. Got two more and then I'm done. The last one, uh, the third one says, uh, Paul said, I want you to be humble and meek. I kind of put those two words together. A humble and meek heart. You know, I put this up here, pride wants groveling. I, you know, sometimes I, I know I'm going to forgive somebody, but I want them to grovel a little bit. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they, they, know, they're, they know they're wrong, and I know they're wrong. So I'm like, but I'm not just going to be like, hey, I forgive you. I want a little bit of like, I want to feel a little bit of power. I want to feel a little bit of like, okay, let's, let's get some significant sorrow going on here before I say sorry. And I think Paul would say, hey, this culture of grace that actually flows out of you're chosen by God, bought by God, and he forgave you. This culture of God says that when you deal with other people, humility should lead the way. A guy named uh, Patrick Lencioni talks about teams. And he says there's three, cat, three traits that make you a good team player. And I would say the most central team in your human relationships is going to be your spouse. And he said the three most important traits to be a good team player is to be humble, to be hungry and to be smart. Humble in the sense that you can own your own stuff and you know you have more to learn. Hungry in the sense that you always want to grow and you always want to be better. And smart in the sense that you're leaning in and you're paying attention and you're figuring out things you don't understand. You're being curious. And I think this humility piece, I think Paul's really smart to say, hey, listen, this whole forgive others as you've been forgiven, it, can't, it won't happen if you're not cultivating a humble heart. It flows out of a humble heart. And then lastly, practice patience in bearing with the slow growth journey of others. He says, bearing with one another. It's not something we're very good in the, in the American church. If you get in my way, you slow me down, you, you stop me from doing the things I want to do to entertain myself, or your mess is an inconvenience to me. Um, you, unless, I, unless I can't get out of it, I'm just going to get out of it. Oh, that, I mean, that's the whole reason for no-fault divorce now. It's just to say, hey, I don't want to deal with whatever journey you're on. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, and they said, you know, they'd gone through a divorce, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and they'd had some kids together, and, and they said, you know, it's an amazing, we were in this, like, really broken place. It's amazing, 15 years later, it's like, she's changed, and I've changed. It's like, oh, for so 15 years, you guys just, you guys got a divorce, you moved on, you got, you know, whatever, you guys aren't getting remarried, but, they, but he's like, he had this perspective to say, it's an amazing thing over 15 years, as we, we were both believers, and we just kept walking toward Jesus. So saying, it's like, if you'd had the, the foresight to be like, 15 years later, God's going to root out that thing. 15 years later, God's going to deal with that struggle. 15 years later, this thing that God's working on again and again and again is, is somehow God's going to move it to the forefront and it's finally going to be crucified. God has a really long view. We don't, usually. And so we go, man, I'm just not... I'm not going to be long-suffering, and I'm not going to bear. I mean, I'll bear. I've got a timetable. I'll bear for, uh, you know, a few weeks. 
oh, I might bear for a year or two. But if things aren't growing the way I want to see them growing and the time I want them to see them grown, then I'm done. The valve is shut off. I've got no more grace for you. And, and I think Paul would say, man, you've got to bear with a lot of patience. And, and, and you think, well, but what if, you know, how many more times do I have to forgive? And you guys all know your Bible. Jesus answered that question to infinity and beyond. And, and here's the thing. We all want people to be patient with our growth journey. We all want that. We're all like, yeah, I know it's my mistake, but I'm a little better than I was yesterday. I mean, I know you want me to get to that faster, but I, you know, my wife would like to see me cook more often. I'm like, you know, she's like, you know, come on now. And I'm like, well, I cooked like once last week. You know, I'm doing a little better. It's like, well, you, gotta, you know, we got to fix some stuff about the way you eat. And I'm like, man, I ate two salads last week. When I met you, I ate no salads. You know, I'm like, be patient with my growth journey. <laughs> And then we turn around and we have very little patience. Because, because the thing is, our brokenness is different than theirs. So I got, if you're broken like I'm broken, man, I've got a lot of bandwidth for you. I got, I got a lot of space. I got a long runway for you to be as broken as I am in the ways that I'm broken. But if it's not like me, I've got about that much space. I'm like, I got this. Get your crap together. Like, I don't know what your deal is. And of course, the gospel, a culture of grace, is one where there's patience, there's bearing, there's long-suffering. And of course, it's all rooted in the forgiveness that's offered freely from God to people who don't deserve it. Rebels running from God were offered grace. That's what we all are. We're rebels running from God. And Paul says, hey, the grace that was offered to you was offered to you when you were far off, while you were still enemies, and now, because of the grace, humility, self-sacrifice of Jesus, you have some forgiveness freely offered to you. Go offer some forgiveness and build a culture where this is freely shared in your family. Amen? All right. I probably talked for too long. So, Graham, you want to come back up here? <laughs>